regenerative medicine. It's the future of medicine. It's here, and it's here to stay. Well, almost. Before we begin, I want to first dedicate this talk to the memory of my maternal grandparents. Unfortunately, they both passed away last year in about uh, six months of each other. They both suffered from ailments and diseases that I believe could have been treated through regenerative medicine, which is why I'm trying to build a future where we can. So this is very near and dear to me. Anyways, what do Prometheus and Botox have in common? You're probably thinking, not so much, right, Stan? You're crazy. Prometheus, according to Greek mythology, was a titan who, had, uh, who stole fire for human use. And as a result, he was sentenced to an eternity of having his liver eaten by, a, by an eagle. As if eternity wasn't enough, each day his liver would regenerate over and over again just to be eaten continuously. Now, I find this to be very interesting because this demonstrates that a concept of regeneration, the idea that the body has a limited capability to regenerate goes as far back as the Greeks, if not even further. Now, today, people are obsessed with appearances, specifically the appearance of remaining youthful, to the point where we willingly inject things like Botox, which is a potent toxin, into our skin. So from Prometheus to Botox, humanity has been fascinated throughout the ages with regeneration and youth. So much so that many people have gone to great lengths. Crusades even have been fought for things like the fountain of youth. Humanity is obsessed with youthfulness, regeneration, eternal life, and there's no end to this in sight. Now, let's bring this all into the context of modern scientific understanding. You've probably all heard of stem cells at some point, but let's get back to the basics in order to understand regenerative medicine. What are stem cells? Stem cells, by definition, have to have two traits, two characteristics. One, they have to have the ability to self-renew. That is, they have to be able to continue growing within a certain state under certain conditions. The second aspect of that is they have to have the ability to morph and grow into different types of tissue. Now, within this is something very important, which brings in what you've probably heard before. Well, what are adult stem cells? What are embryonic stem cells? What are all these different types of stem cells? Well, adult stem cells are just stem cells present in you or I. They have a limited ability to grow into different types of cells. For example, you have blood stem cells in your bone marrow. They can typically become different types of blood cells. On the other hand, embryonic stem cells have the unique capability of turning into almost any type of cell in the human body. That's a trait we call pluripotency. So the key takeaway here is that embryonic stem cells can become almost anything. For example, embryonic stem cells, in this particular case, can form beating heart cells. When you take embryonic stem cells and you put them into dish and just culture them, they can form spontaneously beating clumps of heart cells. Now, if processes like this could be perfected, we will have the ability to use these cells for things like cell replacement therapy in regenerative medicine. However, one key issue still remains, and that is the source of embryonic stem cells. By definition, embryonic stem cells are made from embryos. That is, if you want to make human embryonic stem cells, the process may destroy a human embryo. This has been the subject of great controversy and great debate around the world, especially in my home country, the United States. Now, let's take a step back for a moment and put this all into context. As you can probably tell by now, scientists are pretty passionate about their work at times. And for me personally, I am driven by the possibility that the work we do can potentially positively impact people's lives. But I've learned something in the process, that science does not live in a vacuum. It's not politically neutral. In fact, science is affected and shaped by the policies and politics 
of those in power. I have a personal story about this. When I was first starting my PhD a few years ago, there was a part of my project that I really wanted to work on. The caveat was that this part of my project, under US federal law at the time, was illegal. It was banned. So I thought to myself, well, Stan, no one in my family has ever been to jail, and now is probably not a good time to start. <laughs> so I also thought to myself, well, my parents made a trans-Pacific journey to the United States to pursue the American dream. And I never would have foreseen it at the time, but I found myself as a young adult making my own journey across an ocean to England to pursue my scientific dream. Luckily for me, out of a potentially messy situation, I got to hop the pond to work with one of the foremost researchers in the field. So this is my supervisor. Oh, sorry, that's, that's a tadpole. I apologize, but John, if you're watching, please don't fire me. <laughs> this is my actual supervisor. <laughs> this is Sir John Gurdon. In a series of seminal experiments over 50 years ago, John was able to clone the first animal, an African clawed toad frog. Now, by cloning, I mean the process of taking the nucleus from one cell and putting it into an egg that has had its nucleus removed. This process is able to generate whole new tissues and even entirely new organisms. This work also highlighted two very fundamental aspects of biology. One, that all cells carry the same genes. Before this, we thought different cells carry different genes. If you are a muscle cell, you only had muscle genes, and that's what made you muscle. If you had liver cells, you only had liver genes. But now we know that all cells carry the same genes because you can take these cells and turn them into different types of cells based on how you express these different genes. The second aspect of that biology that we learned was that growth, maturation, differentiation can be reversible. Prior to this, we thought that growth and maturation was only a one-way street, a linear progression. You start as an embryo. You're fertilized. You become um, a fetus, an infant, a toddler. But now we know we can take more mature cells and push them back towards an earlier, uh, less mature state. For this work, John was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine this past year. What implications does all of this have? John's discoveries set the stage for those of Shinya Yamanaka over 50 years later, and he ended up sharing the prize, the Nobel Prize, with John. What Yamanaka was able to do is he was able to just take a few specific factors, in fact, only four, and take any cell and turn it into something that was embryonic-like. Now, this was revolutionary, because now we can take almost, almost any cell in the human body and make embryonic-like cells that are genetically matched to you individually. And on top of this, we can make these cells without having to use human embryos. What does this look like? We have a patient here. We can simply just take a skin biopsy, painless, innocuous, and just by adding these few factors, we can turn that skin cell into something that's embryonic-like, this patient's embryonic-like stem cells. And from this, we can grow different types of tissue, such as nerves. We can grow heart tissue. We can grow liver cells. And using these cells and using these processes, we can even explore and study diseases that we couldn't before. We can even screen drugs against diseases that we, had not, we did not have access to before. Scientists have already begun to do this. In a condition called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, this is a condition that's very difficult. It's untreatable. In this disease, the nerves that connect to your muscles degenerate over time, eventually leading to paralysis and even death. Up until now, it has been very difficult to study diseases like ALS because we simply did not have enough material. Certain cells, certain types of tissue, when you take them out of the body, just can't grow as well. What scientists in Japan did, they were able to take patients with ALS and using these techniques, make in a dish their stem cells and their diseased neurons that were identical to the sick cells and the sick neurons in their bodies. 
Now, this is an advantage because you can just take a skin cell, uh, a skin biopsy from these patients instead of doing painful nerve or muscle biopsies. And on top of this, they are able to make enough cells to even screen compounds against, and potentially they've discovered a new drug for ALS. So how does this all come together? I have a vision for the future of medicine. In this vision, we will be able to reduce suffering and meaningfully improve the quality of life for people all around the world. I believe that a new revolution in modern medicine is about to take place. In the coming years, we will be able to create customized cell lines to people's diseases and screen drugs and screen for therapies in ways we never could before. In the coming decades, if you need a new heart, we will be able to grow that for you from your own tissue. Now, of course, there are several limitations that have to be overcome before we can safely and ethically apply these technologies to people. But I believe that we are moving ever closer to the realm of therapeutic possibility. I believe that these are some of the most exciting times that we are living in now for science, medicine, and the human frontier. Now, as I take a look at my journey thus far, and at the unexpected twists and turns that have happened and brought me to the point where I am, that have brought me across an ocean and to be adopted into a new family, the Gurdon Lab at the University of Cambridge. I realize that I'm very fortunate to work with these wonderful people on a daily basis because science, like any great endeavor, is a truly collaborative effort. And the work that we do is built on the shoulders of those that have come before us and those that are beside us. At the end of the day, though, my hope is that the work that we do via this family will one day impact families like this around the world and into the future. Thank you.